My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Kayfabe Weekly 54. Jim, what day is it? February 27. Somber day, man, in a way, because we recently uh, we recently lost the great Russ Cochran. Uh, he passed away, I think he was uh, 81 or something like that. And a uh, very important guy to me, very important guy to comics fandom. Very important guy to comics history, comics period, cartoonist. He's one of those guys, and sadly, we, we've feels like we've lost a few of these these types of people since, recently, since we started the damn channel where even if you're not directly connected their influence is so vast in comics that if you're into comics it's a super important figure yeah i i think about you know he russ cochran famously he he's the guy who was basically the spearhead of ec comics reprints uh forever basically since the 70s um we, those books you see directly behind us right now here in the studio, man, those multicolor volumes, that's uh, that's Russ Cochran's doing. And, and pretty genius format-wise. Like, these things are known as library sets. These are, these are taking comics and really putting them in a format of great appreciation, giving them weight and significance through the, the context of that format. And again, giant influence. You know, like, like you say, reprinted EC Comics in a few different formats. Yes. Uh, I wasn't affording these when I was a kid. No. But I did see EC reprints that he made that were in affordable formats that I would find in weird places like uh, video stores. I remember vividly a couple of video stores that I would go to that had very few things that weren't videos, but they had a few of the EC Comics reprints. Some of the early major comics fandom really revolved around EC Comics because the the audience there had more disposable income um could have the the their wits about them enough to make fanzines you know a little kid who's reading woody woodpecker man is just doing little kid shit so they had kind of the tightest community squatch front was definitely an important part of the uh ec comics fandom but russ russ cochran was in there early and he convinced uh bill to kind of give them the keys man they were able to shoot uh the original art to make these editions which is key but russ cochran extends beyond just ec because he did similar editions of the carl barks duck comics and the john stanley little lulus and these three series essentially are um the tent poles of what was good comics uh you know, in the pre-Marvel era. Absolutely. Some of the best of the best from those first couple of decades of comics, you know, golden age, I suppose, of comics. And again, because of this format, I'm sure it exposed these comics to not just new generations, but also readers that, you know, you're not finding these on newsstands. Like literally you are finding them in libraries and in these more, I don't know, hallowed places, you know, where it was a sign of respect and just significant comics, you know, for... Think of the generation who this is what they found for comics, right? You know, and went on to continue fandom, comics history, from either critical standpoint, just being a fan and patron supporter of comics, to being possibly the next generation of cartoonists. Like, you know, Ed, you often say whenever you're looking at a at a fellow cartoonist studio, you make judgments based on which EC library sets are on their shelves. Um, it's 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 somewhat ubiquitous with cartoonists that these books are part of of our training of our library of our of the history that most of us agree on whenever you think about American comics history a lot of bad bad comics yeah there are a few high points and and this is definitely one of those high points maybe if Russ Cochran doesn't do it someone else does maybe but this was not common this idea of like let's make a nice deluxe treatment let's repackage this stuff in a, in a real a level kind of treatment and put it out there he did it and uh and he did it for now several generations i mean when does this start late 70s early 80s late 70s uh i spent some time in seattle hanging out at the Fantag fantagraphics headquarters reading through every issue of every fanzine that that gary put together before comics journal and uh you would see ads in there from Russ Cochran soliciting the audience 
asking what would you want to see first? Like if I had the chance to, to bind these things in a super beautiful, like archival boutique edition, what would the first one be? Or should I say, what would the second one be? Because we all know the first one will be Tales from the Crypt. We've got to pay the bills, got to keep the lights on somehow <laughs> with this. But what would the number two thing be? Weird Science. And uh, Weird Science is the one that sold out like the first. Like when I was hook picking these up, I pretty much went aftermarket, but Diamond still had the Weird Fantasy in the 2000s. So you might still be able to get some of those like straight from from Diamond. Uh, but he was, you know, he was soliciting that stuff in trade magazines in the in the 70s, and you could find these like beautiful uh, ads, man, using the Ghastly Graham Ingalls old witch. Um, Dan Klaus told the story of I think he, he even saw it solicited in Comics Journal, but he became uh, essentially a subscriber of these things, like when they came out, uh, which was a hefty price tag, you know. And uh, so he got them as they came out, as they. Every year, every year and a half, there would be a new set that would come out. And he said that when the Weird Science came out, he was sent two of them. And he felt so guilty. And his grandmother was like, you better go get in touch with them. This needs to go back. <laughs> and he, he called the number that came with the package uh, and uh, actually talked to Russ Cochran. And Russ was like, no, I keep it. Our bad, our bad. But Dan said that he... um with colored pencils, like colored the the whole thing, man. So it's like, <laughs> really? Yeah, let's let's see what that looks yeah, like. Yeah, please okay. share a couple pics of that. That'd be great. In uh, as you said, there were many iterations. There were more floppy, mm -hmm. affordable editions. Even in the seventies, they were printed uh, around magazine size. Um, then there were another set of uh, standard edition floppy, but there was like maybe 10 different issues of, of, of things. I remember the, the last issue of Tales from the Crypt was one of them. I think I have that one. But when uh, the floodgates open, when the Tales from the Crypt HBO TV show sure. hits, hits the scene, um, the, there was the 1970s movie, the one with Peter Cushing, but that did whatever it did. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, HBO show starts the weekly blast of Tales from the Crypt. It's in people's consciousness. And he was able, however he was able to do it, man, he was able to get newsstand distribution for those Tales from the Crypt comics. Uh, the Haunt of Fear comes out in 1990, 91. Uh, I was born in 82. I was like eight years old, man. And I got it uh, at the Shop and Save right, right back there. Uh, when mom was going to get some groceries and I was hanging out at the magazine aisle, I got it for, because the Tales from the Crypt at the top, Yeah. I looked inside and it was like, no comics look like this. First off, the artwork is amazing. Second off, what's with this weird lettering? Oh, he's very distinct. And it would be, uh, this was the era where he ganged them up, uh, because he knew that like the weird science one wasn't going to sell. Right. Um, you know, it's very dated looking fish, fish pool helmet type stuff, but uh, he would put the hyperbolic story up front and include like an issue of weird fantasy or something in the back. And uh, I could dig in that box right there, man, and pull it out. And it is floppy. It is flimsy. The amount of times I read that thing, it has a Ray Bradbury story in there. Oh, they were flimsy to start with because that stuff would be on newsprint. And because there would be like double size issues or whatever ganged up, like it did have uh, it was a little flimsy to start with. Yeah. It felt like a comic book. Totally, man. I mean, the comics, that era of comics is like built to be rolled up, put in your back pocket, right next to your slingshot, hop on your Schwinn, and come back home when the street lights come on. Those comics are such of an era. Like, whenever I was a kid, I would have been, you know, getting them at the same time that you're describing early 90s and stuff. And they did feel like this makes sense to me. Like, this is this is the nostalgic past of my parents or something. <laughs> um, now, you know, we're, we're another two generations past that point. But they were like, they did have that sense of when you think of Golden Age comics, that's them. And, you know, amazing that we had the chance that they were distributed newsstand to us at that age. Uh, you know, once again, like, it doesn't exist now. 
Um, but of course, EC Comics legacy lives on. And a big part is because of Russ Cochran doing that and experimenting with formats and recognizing these are great, but also like the kids buying it, it, it shop and say, I need to have a version for him too. Yep. You know, it's a guy that really believed in these comics and getting them out there. And we've talked about, you know, coming out of fandom and, and, and comics, uh, you know, comic zines. And so I brought one. I randomly was reading this this week. Uh, Kay Faber had sent us a, a few of these. And uh, this is a pretty well, RBCC, pretty well known. There's an ad in here, two-page spread. And this is from, I think, 1970, I believe is the date on here. I don't see a date, but I, it's, it's 69 or 70. But this is a two-page spread of Russ Cochran want lists. I'm, I'm sure you can't make out those details at home. But it's list of comics that he has available um, for sale or for trade, along with his want list, what he's looking for along with some artwork that he has that uh, is either for sale or he's looking for it or he's willing to trade it for some of the stuff that he is looking for. And it's pretty neat to see, you know, there's a Walt Disney section, there's an EC section. So you can see where the, where his tastes lie. You know, it is definitely what we think of historically as, as sort of the upper end of that era of comics. And then, of course, where he then puts his money and time as he starts making this stuff and putting this stuff out there. So, you know, this is probably eight years before you know the first set is released eight or ten years but moving in that direction and if you were to go through a bunch of fanzines you can probably trace his progress through that and you mentioned ec being a big part of the fanzine culture at the time there are articles in here chronicling different aspects of ec um, not necessarily by russ cochran although i'm sure you can find articles by russ cochran about that subject uh but it is it is a, a really interesting part of Comics history, it goes from being very much a few influential fans keeping this alive to let's let's bring this out and, and make it mainstream, at least mainstream in terms of comics uh, and availability to comics fans. That is a huge, huge service. We can't say enough what a service that is because it does then inform generations and give access to us uh, long before the Internet. Yeah, yeah. Um... It's a legacy, man. You know, it, it's it's a legacy that will that obviously will outlive him at this point, but a significant legacy for comics history that that if, that he's there's a handful of these guys that really contribute in a way that goes on far beyond them and touches hundreds of thousands of lives. And uh, and, and that's that's a big contribution. So. Can't overstate it. It's true. And uh, it, it was fandom culture that kind of kept comics alive as long as it had, you know, like the business interests have come in and kind of stabilized things and kind of made businesses out of it. Um, but I think he was one of the early guys who had the business mind. Now, I don't know. I didn't know the guy personally. Like, I didn't know if he went into a hawk for all of this and how he lived or whatever. My sense is he lived pretty comfortably and uh, it would take a special kind of maniac to keep doing the same thing and, and having bad results, but still doing it, you know, like that's saintly uh, in terms of, you know, the comics gods or whatever. But I think he did OK. And, uh, you know, we benefited from that. Man. I'll tell you, based on that ad that I just showed, the taste that he displays in that ad, like it is it is very refined. You know, I mean, I would assume he did all right. If he was collecting this original art at that stage, the stuff that he was how foster art and things, you know, like really high-end artwork and, and, you know, the top of comics history at that time. And, and it remains that way today. So right. I would guess that a uh, pretty smart guy. I used to get uh, the um, subscriptions that he had a newsletter that would come out. Um, I, I was obsessed with these things, man. Like I was doing everything I could to piece together the, the run because I, you would pick up any issue of those and it would be amazing. Like every, any issue is as good as any other issue. Uh, so it's like, I want, well, I want them all, you know, <laughs> and uh, I got his newsletter in the in the 90s, man, like right when he started doing like these were finished and he started putting out like the pre trend, you know, the new trend is Tales from the Crypt. And then there's the pre trend. And that's where like a lot of the artists kind of like get grandfathered in. So, you know, a mood, a maid romance and like those things. <laughs> uh, but the other stuff that he was hustling was was uh, 
he's almost like a antiquarian kind of character, like uh, like a bud plant. Like he had his own kind of small mm-hmm. version of that where he was doing these other kind of like art books and and um, things, but still was very much rooted in fandom, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, that kind of sure. early fandom stuff. Man. So rest in peace, Russ Cochran. Uh, I, this is this is my drawing. This ain't kayfabe. This is my drawing table. I sit there every day and I look up at those EC hardcovers that he published, and I tell myself I better put my fucking head down uh, and learn something because I'm humbled in the presence of the material that is between those hardcovers. Put some videos out this past week. Yeah, I was gonna say, good transition. Uh, we go from EC to let's talk manga manga. Frederick Schott's uh, revolutionary 1983 book, but reissued several times over the years since then. But huge introduction to Japanese comics for the Western world. Um, man, that was fun to revisit. Fun to talk to you about, Ed. Uh, we've gotten some great feedback in the comments section. So, you know, anybody that hasn't watched it yet, if you're interested in comics history, both American and Japanese comics history, it's an incredible book. Yeah, I'm... I'm- so I speak about humbled. Frederick Schott's a guy who humbles me in almost every conceivable way because of his outlier position, um, being there on the ground floor of essentially like bringing manga to America. Um, I have been put into contact with the dude. I really hope to get him on the channel. He's in Japan right this minute. <laughs> He's in Japan right this minute. When he comes back, I'm going to give him a little bit of time get that jet lag out of the system but we have to get them on this channel as soon as possible and there are any number of conversations that uh that we need to have with him now that we have this channel now that we have such access could you imagine an overlapping trip to japan with him like, like if you amazing. met up with him in japan and got him to kind of lead you around and show you some stuff amazing what must he look at when he's there good question and that's something that we would ask him i i mentioned it on the uh on the video, um, there was the the um, it, it, still in Japan. People st- st- out there still talk about it. Um, that early 1980, 1979 trip when Tezuka and Go Nagai and uh, Monkey Punch and all of the like all of the most popular mangaka at that time came to San Diego Comic Con. How many comics fans? No Japanese and are going to be, and live in California and are going to be able to shepherd them around. I have to imagine Fred Schott was a big part of that. So I want to have the. I hope he's a great talker. Yes. Because I would love to just have him on. It it would take a couple of shots, I think, man, because I want to hear about that and I don't want any stone unturned in that conversation alone. Yeah, I, I feel so overwhelmed at times from the amount of comics, like content swirling around, whether it's what we're prepping for or what we finished and now reflecting on, getting, you know, people making comments and filling in gaps. It just feels like there's so much information. And he's a huge piece. You know, you talk about that Comic Con where all these Japanese creators came over. That's another one of those. There are moments that are just like the waves of influence that this generates. And that's one of them. Because this comes after. How many people then go on to have careers based on that kind of thing. Where's Torrent Smith come from? You know what I mean? Like there are these moments where it's like manga splashes down in the U S or makes an impact or is covered in some of the fandom and everything has to spin out of those couple of really influential moments. We did that, uh, Kaze Shinobu, uh, episode from some of the material that I've grabbed from, uh, from my trip to Japan. And there's a strip in there that shows up in heavy metal that's probably a direct correlation from Kazi Shinobu visiting San Diego Comic Con, making some moves, making some connects, and then he publishes this small strip that can't be by accident. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, like, and these guys, these are these are these are working mangaka. Um, I have that uh, that watching the Watchmen mm-hmm. book, and Dave Gibbons was talking about like first Alan Moore got the trip to San Diego. Um, in the midst of May, it, Watchmen took two years of production. And uh, so Alan Moore gets the trip to San Diego. The next year, they're still in the midst, man. Watchmen is half finished in terms of progress. Uh, it's Dave Gibbons' turn. 
And Dave Gibbons was preparing to come to San Diego and to draw while doing his appearances and stuff like that. Um, it didn't work out because Alan Moore was writing some other stuff and the time it would take for those pages to get to San Diego from London might as well just come back. Um, a mangaka with a weekly schedule? Something tells me those motherfuckers are spending some time in the, in the hotel room. Yeah, you're probably right on that. Uh, you do have to weigh all the travel stuff, like what is valuable, you know, because, I mean, they do open up a market. It might take a decade or two for that to really pay dividends, but, I mean, like, pioneers, like those guys, ambassadors, you know, that really bring that here and, and to, you know, great sacrifice on their end to carve out a week um, from a full-time schedule like that. There was the great uh, Osama Tezuka documentary that you could find floating around on YouTube. And there's a part where uh, Tezuka takes a trip to France, they call it, ostensibly, I imagine it's Angoulême. And he's doing his glad handing. He runs up to the room, does a couple pages, goes downstairs, parties, runs upstairs, draws a couple pages, looks at the camera, says, this is hell, but then puts his hand back, back down and, and gets busy. From that documentary, uh, Tom, Tom had a great uh, hypothesis about the Tezuka avatar, the costume, because he got the beret and the lokes and shit. And... Uh, Tom's theory is that that's a caution. That's how you associate Osama Tezuka with like who he is. So if he wanted peace out in the public, he would just not wear that shit. You know? Could be. Yeah. It seems, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask Fred. <laughs> yes, do that. Fred, it's, get it's, back to America, man. It reminds me so much of secret identities and comics and superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> the song, if you're going out as Osama yeah. Tezuka. <laughs> I mean, he even draws it that exact same mm. way and everything, man. It's um, fun. On brand. Yeah. But great book. Um, I discovered the existence of that book from Wizard Magazine, along with some of the kayfabers out there. They made those notes. But it wasn't really the manga manga book. It was, it was uh, I guess maybe even it was new at the time, was that Dreamland Japan or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. I forget what it's called. Um, I, I don't know that book. Um, but manga manga was like you know that was talked about too and so thankful to uh, get my hands on that that was after uh, i think i had given up on wizard by that point i don't remember seeing it in wizard um i found out about it i think bill at copacetic just put it in my hand one day uh, early on you know yeah whenever i was starting to get to know him and, and talking about comics and where my interest was so it was relatively random you know there's lots of books at his shop that look good or sound good or whatever uh, so grateful to just have it cross my path. You know, there's so many books like that. And I'm sure there's so many for, for whatever manga manga I read. I'm sure there's a hundred great comics related books that I haven't read or don't know about, um, you know, haven't distinguished. But very fortunate to get that one early on. Great to be able to do a reread instead of just the first read through. You know, you always find a lot more stuff. And Fred Shot just he nails so many things. Like one of my favorite parts of that book is talking about the mechanics of reading manga mm -hmm. and and how the pages are read back and forth between image and text and you're almost reading the pages a scanning method like taking in all of the action at once and i have become a bigger and bigger manga fan in the last couple of years and i'm convinced part of it is that reading experience i enjoy that kind of i don't know interplay between my brain and the page the way it's laid out and read as opposed to a very like line of text line of text same with you know a nine panel grid you read panel one text and image i like that kind of like scanning where it's almost like things are firing in my head as i'm i got it you know i recognize this page i've got the sound effects the text everything got it understand and do it quickly you know like like in that in manga manga it says 3.75 seconds <laughs> average to, to read a page um but it just almost the physical response of reading that way it's different than regular reading for me, mm -hmm. and I love it. I love that sensation, and it's cool to see some of those ideas broken down. And he does a really good job of that, covering it from like this is history and development of this cartooning language. This is the mechanics of how the language works. This is the industry and the different genres. It's incredible. Yeah, it's 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 for the for that time period. It's everything that you could could want and and sort of need. 
all appropriate context is provided. Uh, because there is a little bit of a culture shock depending on the comic that you get your hands on. Like, what is, what is this? Sure. He explains it very clearly. And uh, there's there's a lot of great stuff about the time capsule uh, phenomenon with the book. Because he's clearly into it. Um, this is a big deal to him. But it just gets so much bigger. And... He's he's very important to that, and and I wonder if he even knows it. I don't know. Good good stuff to talk to him about. You know, academia has this thing where if you come up with a with a new idea, it's almost a pyramid the way ideas and knowledge spread, and that's what that book is. Yeah. Like it's really close to that top pyramid point of here's a whole bunch of new information, and then slowly people gravitate toward different aspects and they spread and they build on it. And that book feels like one of those damn near the top of the pyramid of like, here's a bunch of new knowledge to open up to comics fans. Yeah. I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about all the questions I would ask <laughs> because it's like, it's like, you must know Viz people. Oh, I'd, I'd imagine. He must've put, put, you know, these connections together to like, it's going to be fast. Like, Fred, get back to America, man. Yeah. We're looking forward to that. Let's chat. <laughs> That'll be great. And speaking of Dreamland Japan, I don't know that you should have uh, mentioned that before you ordered a copy, Ed. <laughs> Sometimes we hear stories about, uh, what do they call it? The uh, hey, fave effect. Hey, fave effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually ordered my copy of Dreamland Japan uh, shortly after we recorded the episode. Um, I haven't gotten it yet. I haven't read it yet. So I'm looking forward to that. I've heard good things, quite a few comments about it. Um, and it sounds like a really good book. So I am looking forward to it based on manga manga for sure. Other video we put up, man, Cat Comics. Cat Comics, uh, good response to that. If you haven't watched that one yet, Ed, you were skeptical, I think, whenever I pulled out a box of Cat Comics. I wasn't skeptical. <laughs> Maybe a little. I was just like, uh, you know, time is valuable, but I'll talk Cat Comics if you want to talk Cat Comics, man. And They're obviously a huge history of, of cats in comics from Crazy Cat to manga and everything in between. Um, and I solicited feedback from viewers to add cat comics that we should check out so do that if you're watching this video please go post the cat comics that we should check out here's how you do it k fabers so <laughs> socially inept ones and uh, socially aware ones alike uh you say i recommend dot 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 uh you look like a douchebag when you're like uh oh you guys forgot <laughs> such and such. Yo, but about blah, 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 blah. Fuck you. You're a douchebag. Talk to us correctly. There, there, there probably are a few that we forgot, but there are a lot that we know of, and it's just a matter of space. There was one that covers so many. The, the one that, that I forgot, um, because I wasn't expecting you to, to come with a, with a box of cat comics, was uh, I, I have Maxwell the, the cat. Yeah, that was one that I thought of too after the fact. It, it does happen. The, the Man, there's so many of these things. But that's why I've asked people to make comments underneath, uh, because I want it to be a resource. I like cat comics, so let's make this a, a resource where people can go and find all of these things, uh, because it is quite a bit of comics history, weirdly. Once I started looking, it was like, oh, there's a lot more here than I realized. Do you have a favorite? I like Crazy Cat. I had a really good experience with Crazy Cat many, many years ago um, when I was working a lot and I took Christmas Day off. And I ended up reading like the Sunday press book, a few of those crazy cats. And if you read crazy cat, I recommend read like four of them at a time at most, sure. because it is dense and it's nice to kind of pour over it rather than like, I want to just read this book. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. But I sat down, I had nothing to do for a couple hours that day and just really poured over a few of those pages. And that's when crazy, that's when crazy cat clicked for me. And it was just like, some of it is context. You know, I was reading it under really good circumstances. I was reading a nice format of it. But also, like, that's a magical comic strip. Like, you start reading it, and it's you enter the world. I think all the best, all my favorite comics have that quality, yeah. where it's almost like a different language. But then once you get the language, it's like a world opens. And Crazy Cat has that, so it's it's hard to beat that. Just on a kind of this world language, nothing else like it on Earth. Um, you know, it's it's a transport. It's it's that escape. It's you're traveling somewhere when you get into those. So that one's pretty good. 
They're not Manfred the man. <laughs> Kidding me, man? <laughs> you're lucky, definitely, you're lucky definitely you guys have us, man, to, to like <laughs> steer your taste in the direction. Yeah, I was happy somebody posted Pop Cat, and I actually have some Pop Cat comics. It's based on the old comic or the old cartoon. Um, it must be a Adele or probably Adele, um, one of those kids comics publishers. And that was one I didn't pull out of the long boxes, but it was funny to see it pop up because there are so many of those. But, you know, they come in such different directions. Um, the Junji Ito yeah. is, is great. Like, it's a phenomenal comic, and cats are a part of it. But that's just a good comic to read. Um, so I don't know about a favorite. Hard to pick one. Did you get your Todd McFarlane five pages done this past week? I did not. I don't know if I will ever quite be at that pace, but I did get four pages done, which is... I'm very happy with that and uh, was feel, feel good about this week. Did some fun stuff in those pages too. Like, yeah, you did. One of the things I did, and I don't know if we'll ever do a video on this topic, Ed, but I'm really into space mm-hmm. in comics and like the uh, film calls it the 180 degree rule, yeah. which is to sum it up, if characters on the right, they stay on the right. Uh, characters from left to right can be disorienting unless you see them switch. Like there's a narrative reason and I'm going to show it to you. And I did that in these pages this week. And it's one of the few times that I've done it where it's like, you're reading mostly left to right. Most of the action, the progress, the movement goes left to right. And I reverse that direction. And so I don't know if I've ever done that exactly in a comic, but I have a character go back then and have to kind of like fight back through what we've come through and switch the direction. And so I was, uh, I was pleased with that. And it's one of those things that I love it. It won't mean any, if it's done, if it works, it won't mean anything to read. It should It'll be just visible. sort of flow. But in my mind, it was something I wasn't sure about doing. And when I got done with it, it was like, all right, I feel good about that. It's that old uh, adage about like, know the rules in order to break them. Um, been real clunky, you know, could have fucked up, but you knew the rules and you have used the common wisdom uh, the sta- standard way to do things for a long time. So it's like, you know what, man? I'll fuck with this. It's a good effect. Yeah, it's fun. It's 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 almost dancing because it's two main characters and it's like we need them to reverse direction. That's what I was thinking about, like cho- choreography. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is um one of the noteworthy pieces of like the Frank Miller Daredevil run was like the choreography of, of these scenes. And he would do similar similar things, man. You can't just like, Keep punching a guy that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Run into the wall at some point. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, that that was, like, one of those instances where you would be aware of that phenomenon. And Miller's aware of that, you know? Yeah, I think I think Miller's, a lot of it even goes back to Eisner. That was one of the things that always felt very Eisner-esque to me, which would be, like, stage direction uh-huh. of characters in a, in a limited space. Think of Paige going back and forth. Now, How about you? You brought up Eisner, and it's like, motherfucker did seven pages a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Seven pages a week. Well, look, man, manga could be 20 pages a week sometimes, so. Yeah, no, like. I'm not going up to that someday. No, no, I'm not even, I'm just, I'm, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, harsh on you. It was, like, he did seven, like, you know what I mean? Just pay, paying homage and respects to him. Uh, I, I did get five, but only because, um. A couple two panel pages, man. A couple big yeah. pages, man. If you're on my uh, Instagram, you know the pages I'm talking about uh, because you're going to see a body get disrespected. <laughs> those pages are getting intense, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> you send me a block of those pages. <laughs> I worry about your readership in the future. Yeah. That's why we have the uh, P.O. box, man. Not any home addresses. <laughs> Smart. Now I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's just been a, a pleasure, man. I was on that trajectory since i've been drawing smaller i was on that trajectory even before the conversation with uncle todd but but even after the convo it's like marching orders like put put that energy in uh i will accept advice i will accept advice from the people who have like two and a half robert parish worth of zeros at the end of their print runs man uh (laughs) and he's got three to four Robert Parishes. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I've been taking it very seriously, putting the grind in, and I was taking a look at from the time I finished what I thought was going to be issue one, you know, so the start of like issue two, 
where I'm at now, I have 25 pages done, dude. That can easily sustain a monthly schedule. Um, but what I'm going to do, and I said it before, uh, I'm going to gang up. I sort of changed the storytelling approach a little bit. I was able to do that at the stage I'm at with this. Change the storytelling approach a little bit so that the first issue is like double size, first issue, a complete unit, reasonably standalone. It's a standalone story. Um, I will explore the characters further, kind of like the great uh, Stray Bullets. Did, did we have that conversation last week? I know mm. we had it. I don't know if we had it on the record. <laughs> I was going to say, I know we've talked about it. Yeah. I don't know if we've talked about it in front of a camera. But the, what I loved about like the first 20 issues of, of Stray Bullets was you just got this like very satisfying chunk yes. unit. And it was standalone, but it fit with everything else. That's going to be sort of my approach. I'm on this, I'm on this uh, journey to try to make a satisfying monthly comic. How do you do that? I was revisiting Essentials and looking at like the great early Spider-Mans and all of that, and it made me think about the fucking jobber writers of today and how each of those issues would be a six-issue miniseries. It'd be a six-issue miniseries introducing Electro. It would be a six-issue miniseries introducing Rhino. And uh, would that have had legs in 1963? I don't think so. So if we like comic shops, if we want people to go to comic shops, if you want something good at a comic shop on a regular basis, well, why don't we try to make that thing, you know? And here are the steps I'm going to take to, to do it. And I implore any makers out there, Please do the same. Like, let's 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 make some changes to the game. We're in a position where we could like put those orders out and and affect it ourselves. Um, take some time away from soliciting. Maybe I'll take all of 2020 and just see how many issues I put together in the year of 2020, and then solicit so that I have a big uh, jump on when the issues start coming out. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do a year's worth even. Uh, before the solicitation so that uh, so that it could come out regularly. Follow Jim Shooter orders to some extent. Every issue is somebody's first issue. So create a, a, a scenario that is satisfying that could that could like launch people into it um, feeling like they've they got their money's worth. Don't give me part three of some bullshit. Um, when I was putting together Grand Design, I got to hang out with with uh, Chris Claremont at, at his crib, and he was like, "Days of Future Past is two issues," you know. That was a, sort of a Jim Shooter thing, where Jim Shooter's like, it was a big deal to get Craven's Last Hunt, you know what I mean, like a six issue or five issue yeah. thing. Um, that was a big change, and maybe I'll do some two issue things or something. But still, you got to make every unit satisfying. So that uh, we could keep the, the 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 pamphlet going, the floppy. I want to keep issues going, you know. But I, they have to be satisfying. A lot of uh, K favors have been sending us stuff, and they're sending us, you know, their doubles of modern comics. Essentially, I'll give them a read, and I, they're horseshit. Like they, it's it's a disrespect to the reader because you're charging me four bucks read just like a an unsatisfying piece of a big story get the of course it's going to be unhealthy if everybody's following that bad logic but i'm not going to follow that logic dude i don't understand how this isn't 101 from everybody it, i i think publishers should mandate this i think comic book shop should demand this i think creators should want to do this yeah. like it's it's incredible to me that it's treated in such a disposable format like then don't make it. Make make a graphic novel. That happens. Lots of gra plain Jane's graphic novel. Like it's it's pretty common that you just do a graphic novel. Hip hop family tree graphic novels. That's a format that's acceptable now, and we know how to do that. We know how to make them and sell them, and, and stores know how to handle them. So like, if it's really not, if you can't do it in in those parts in the units that are comic books, don't do it in comic books. I don't know how it's gotten to this point that the majority of comic books that come out are not satisfying on their own. 
I and love- everybody just signs off on it. I assume everybody who's involved in that comic book that we find impossible to sell, impossible to read, unhappy, unsatisfying. And yet everybody I assume is okay with it because their names are on it. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. It's It's very frustrating. It's not a healthy practice. If you think of this medium, you know, it's not a healthy practice that you would make these products that a month, two weeks later or something, they're no longer even worth their cover price because you have a very tiny group that you're catering those to who are willing to buy them, even if they need to buy 47 other issues over the next two years or whatever. But we can do better. We did do better. We have long, we all have boxes of better. Like, and, and any of those are more satisfying to read than a random issue off the racks. Yes. Today. Yes. We know how to do it. We have decades of examples of how to do it. We could be doing that. Let's do that. All of us. Let's that's, do that. That's the move. That That is the move. And uh, if any, like I could sell you on the idea, makers out there, I could sell you on the idea because I'm speaking from a genuine place of excitement that I have to look forward to. Uh, I am wrapping up what was going to be issue two. Uh, I'll wrap it up this next week, probably. And then I have a 22 page story for issue two, you know, like, like I will, and it'll be, I'll be able to test some things. I'll be able to experiment a little. And if it doesn't work, I have another one the next uh, 20 is low commitment. So like the story that you think is great, man, that you get to put a spine on with your six issue thing. There's a reason everybody forgets it next year. You know what I'm saying? Like you're committed. It's all your eggs in one basket kind of thing, man. And if you're dead set on it and you put that kind of energy into it, you then have something great. But if it's just a job, man, that's weak. Here's the thing, too. Make make all the formats that you decide to publish in, make them satisfying. Yes. But then you're not limited to just one of them. You can make a comic book. You can make a digital release. You can serialize it wherever on your site, on a blog, on social media. You can collect a chunk of them in books. You know, like we're ta- we started about talking about Russ Cochran, you know, representing these ec comics to new generations and it's like here's a deluxe beautiful expensive volume that you may want for your shelf if you can afford it here's the floppy one that you can find in the grocery store for the kid that has two bucks in their pocket or whatever you know you can have access to all of those formats just make them work and if you can't make it work then don't do that format but this is another way of like you can sell this stuff to different audiences in different formats and you get a little bit from each one yeah. and it adds up. All you have to do, all we have to do, Jim, is, is, is be correct. And people are going to follow along, you know? So with this Red Room thing I'm working on, man, I hope the audience shows up because it will prove viable. It's like, you know, what I did the Hip Hop Family Tree thing for a minute. And when Marvel came a calling, I was able to get them to change format. There are no, those books that you see that are brand design format, like that Silver Surfer thing, my shit was first. You know what I mean? And I got to get the big corporation, I got to get Disney to change their practice a little bit. It was a simple change, man. But that was my, my goal with X-Men Grand Design was twofold. I wanted to give them incentive to give a singular cartoonist a shot. Um, beyond me, because like I knew my shit was going to sell, no, no, no problem. Accomplish that. I wanted them to have faith in a different format. If my shit was not published uh, at that big size, I wasn't going to participate. That was like it wasn't in the contract. It was a homeboy agreement, and if they wouldn't have done it, I would have fucking I would be dissing them constantly. But they did it, and they're rewarded for it. So my next phase, and like I'm gonna be good for a hot minute, and I'm gonna be putting work in for quite a while uh, on various things. But my next thing is like, I don't think that it's a, I don't think that monthly comics are have to be defeated. I think they can be, uh, there can be a resurgence. Um, I think it's gonna take work 
it just has to take one person to be right. I'm on board. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to go to the comic store regularly. And be excited for yeah. for like the new issue of this or the new issue of that. It is and interesting not, because it can drive, you know, like there's trickle down for that too. Um, oh man, who, I just heard somebody talking and it was about people coming out, coming back to comic book stores for this this person or this book. And I can't remember what, they, what it was. Again, too much content, yeah. too much comics in my head. But they made the point of several retailers told them, you know, like, there were new people coming back. I think it was Matt Wagner, whenever he did the second Mage series, um, just saw an interview with him talking about that. And so, you know, that trickles down. When I go to the comic book store, I don't go every Wednesday anymore. But when I go, I go for the thing I'm going for. And then I end up, inevitably, I end up with a couple of other things. So you just need that one, that one beacon, the one thing that makes the person come in. And then hopefully... There's other stuff that will appeal to them. So good. Go for it. That's the I'm mission. On board. That's the mission, man. So you guys out there, you'll know that if you see an issue of Red Room on the stands, you could pick it up and you don't need the previous one. It's going to be satisfying. Retailers, you're going to know that as well. Uh, we'll see what happens, Ben. It's going to take some time. I got to put, put some work in, dude. I have like 56 pages done and that's still just... That's still issue one. It's going to be a double size first issue. Introduce you to the universe. Introduce you to the world. Give, give you some new nightmares. Give you a rule set. And then uh, if you're on board, next one's going to be cool. Like, obviously, it's a weird subject and, it, and it's hardcore. Like, you cat comic lovers are probably not going to uh, be, be on board with, with Red Room. That's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, what, what can I do? But I'm going to have ideas that are more wide ranging. It's just like, let me get this one out of my system for now. And uh, I'm not going to stop making comics with, with vigor anytime soon. You know, I have ideas. Yeah, I, I don't feel like that's ever going to be the problem. No, man. Uh, what else, man? Um, what else? E-newsletter is up and running and we are finishing up our first giveaway. Yeah. So if you have not subscribed to the e-newsletter yet, there's a link below this video to that. Um, and we have a video of that first giveaway, which is a lot of my doubles, uh, as many as I can stuff into a flat rate box. Um, but sign up for our e-newsletter. We have uh, a, a few more comics that we plan to give away to uh, subscribers in the future. Um, yeah, so. we'll, we'll, we'll tease it. We'll tease it probably almost every show, man. There'll be like a, a new giveaway. You have a bunch of inventory of your stuff. I have a bunch of inventory of my stuff. And some of it's fucking cool shit. I would say all of it's cool shit. What am I talking about? Man? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of it's cool stuff. Uh, I went raiding some back issues. Got some very key issues that these stores had no idea were as rare and sought after as, as they are. So they're doubles to me, man. I'm sending them to a kayfaber. Yeah, I like that. That's fun. But you got to get on that e-newsletter uh, mailing list. Yes. In order to to get that, and we don't we don't bog down your email. We just send uh, one uh, newsletter every two weeks. Yeah. So it's it's still kind of in its experimental stage. We're still figuring that stuff out. But sign up. Help us figure it out. Help us make it a valuable piece of cartoonist kayfabe. Yeah, I plan on serializing more stuff. Like I really like serializing the uh, the script pages for for the X Men comic. But as things move forward, it's like we're going to really be able to use that space, man. And it, it'll be like it'll be like the secret base or something, man, the secret clubhouse. Yeah, it's funny. I've been subscribing so to more and more of these newsletters to kind of see what people are offering from all sorts of different different uh, outlets and picking and choosing, you know, finding the stuff that I respond to and I appreciate and trying to incorporate that into our own. And it all started because there was a newsletter I liked that I used to get on Saturday mornings and it was like. I enjoyed that. That was this yeah. moment of drinking coffee, taking it easy, and just looking at some of the stuff this guy was making. And so hopefully we'll get, you know, that, that's part of what we'll be building with that piece. And that's around the like schedule that we put out, right? It's like mm -hmm. every every two weeks on like a late Friday night, early, right. early Saturday morning. Wake up so Saturday like... morning and catch up on whatever cartoonist kayfabe you may have missed. Uh, man, we have some good stuff coming up. We have some good stuff coming up very soon, man. If you're not subscribed to the channel, you're going to want to be, and you're going to want to be here Sunday. 
Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the channel is is evolving in an amazing way. Um, we hit thirteen thousand way faster than than I thought we would. We're on that race to fifteen, and then. At that point, we're only 10% to the 150,000 that I want. <laughs> yeah, so keep spreading the word. Keep sharing it. You know, we do a lot of different videos. And uh, in my mind, I, I can't remember where I picked this up, but I remember a guy, a, a creative person early on saying he didn't want anybody to like everything he did because that would mean he was doing the same. But he wanted to have something that would appeal to everyone you know, if you, if you look through his body of work and I feel like that's a lot of what we're doing. So when we do a cat video, if that's your thing, share that, mm -hmm. you know, when we interview Todd McFarlane, if, if he's your guy, share that video. Um, you know, it's how we're getting, it's how we've got to 13,000. It's how we'll get to 150,000 and it's all with you. So, you know, keep giving us the feedback, but keep sharing these, these videos, keep sharing the podcast, the e-newsletter. Um, you know, it's just comics. Like we are just here with comics and uh in my mind comics are everything so we will have a video for you sooner or later if you're a comics fan and if you're watching this chances are we've already had several so share those man you know let us keep uh keep keep digging into our boxes giving you access to our drawing tables and uh just sharing the love that is comics there's a there's a lot of videos like sort of in the chamber man and what i love most like i just like the see the blend of them because it's exactly what it is man here's some manga stuff here's a little bit of mainstream you here's know a little bit of how to make comics yeah yeah it's the channel that it's the channel that i want it wasn't there when i was looking for it make the thing very fun if it's not there fucking make it for sure and uh man before we know it con season will be here so uh we'll be out on the road with some of this stuff and uh Doing whatever we can think of, man. Visiting collections, visiting stores, and uh, just keeping it up. That's it, man. But you guys, you're going to want to be here Sunday. Got some fresh stuff for you. Sunday's fun. Got done recording some shit. And uh, we're going to get back to it, man. Uh, do you have anything else? I, I don't. don't. Give them the marching orders. We'll bounce, dude. Read more comics. Bam.